We're back for a brand new series. On the programme today, urgent appeals on murder and fraud cases and the volunteers clocking up thousands of hours of unpaid policing. This is Crime Watch Live. Hello and welcome back to a new series coming to you live from our brand new studio here in Cardiff. And we've got a packed show to kick things off. On International Women's Day, we'll be finding out about a crime that's disproportionately affected women during lockdown. And we'll be asking for your help to catch these two cash machine distraction thieves who targeted a pensioner. Our phone lines are already open. So let's get straight on with this morning's first appeal. The disabled father caught up in a car theft that went terribly wrong. He was happy, jolly. He always makes sure we're all having fun. He was very outgoing. We was like chalk and cheese. I was the introvert, he was the extrovert. <laughs> I couldn't, I really couldn't have wished for a better brother. He was very caring, very caring and, and genuine and like baked beans in a tin. If you opened up it, you just get baked beans. Like what you saw with him is what you got. Yeah, I, I, I love him. I'll always love him. Fifty-one-year-old Mark Allen lived with his son Brandon in Erith, South East London. Me and Dad were very close. I lost my mum a few years ago, so I've only ever grown up knowing my dad. I always looked up to him and always loved him with everything I had. Mark would have, he would have walked through fire for his boy. He would have done, he would have done anything for him. My brother worked so hard to be the best dad that he could be. They proper loved each other, proper, proper loved each other. In 2018, complications caused by Mark's diabetes meant he needed to be hospitalised. He eventually had his leg amputated and replaced with a prosthetic. He used to joke and say, I could be a pirate now forever. All I need is like a little parrot on my, on my shoulder for fancy dress, because <laughs> I've already got the foot. So yeah, that was a sense of humor though. He got a specially adapted Mercedes to enable him to continue his job as a salesman. Dad's pride and joy was that car, everything. He loved that car to pieces. On the 28th of December, 2019, Mark and Brandon spent the day together, watching TV and enjoying a takeaway. Brandon left at around 11 p.m. I walked out and stayed with my girlfriend, so that was the last time me and Dad spoke. Police don't know exactly what Mark did after that, but the events of that night would end in catastrophe. Now police are working to piece together what happened. They believe that in the early hours of the morning, a man may have approached Mark's flat, coming down Pearswood Road and into Page Crescent. We believe he jumped over this wall and in through that window, which was open at the time. What we don't know is what happened whilst he was inside the premises. After a few minutes, witnesses hear a commotion coming from Mark's driveway. That's my car! At that point, we believe the suspect has got the keys to the car and has reversed it off Mark's drive. Police believe Mark was thrown over the car. But the man drove off, leaving him lying in the road. Mark suffered a devastating head injury. He was rushed to hospital. When I was first told, I didn't want to believe it happened. Shock. I think that was the first thing, shock. 
Mark was in a coma for a month. I just kept thinking, he's just going to wake up, he's just going to wake up, hoping every day that it would change. I think I was kind of numb to what was going on. But I think the hardest bit was seeing the pain um, in my mum's eyes. Still got all the text messages I sent him. <laughs> One of them said, You can have so many texts when you wake up. <laughs> but he didn't wake up. On the 29th of January 2020, Mark passed away. It was really hard as a family. Brandon was, like, so brave and just held his hand. I think of Dad every single day, really. I'm trying to make the best out of my life as I could with what's happened. I couldn't even imagine what he's had to go through for the last couple of years, losing his mum, then losing his dad as well. I don't think I would have been as strong as what he's been, so I'm, I'm proud of him. I'm really, really proud of him. More than a year on, Mark's family are still looking for justice. He died because they took his car. You know, it's a piece of metal at the end of the day. And you took his life over a piece of metal. And that's not right. It's not right. All we want is justice for what's happened. We just want peace. Well, it's just awful. And Detective Inspector Jason Fitzpatrick from The Met, who's leading the investigation into Mark's murder, joins me now via video call. Uh, Jason, good morning. Can you just remind me exactly what we do know that happened that night? Good morning, Mark. Yeah, uh, we know it was the 28th of uh, December 2019, uh, and Mark had been at home uh, in Pearswood Road in Erith with his son Brandon. They'd had a meal together, and Brandon left at about 11 pm. And it was after that point, at around 11 pm, where the details are not exactly clear, are they? No, we believe a, a male approached and entered Mark's flat in the early hours of the 29th. Shortly afterwards, at around 2.50 a.m., witnesses heard uh, shouting coming from Mark's driveway. And it's at that point we believe that uh, the car was deliberately driven at Mark and he was found unconscious in the road by witnesses. Unfortunately, we don't know much about the suspects involved and that's what we're really appealing for today. Uh, we'd really like to speak to anybody who can help fill in the gaps of what happened that night. Yeah, they could be absolutely crucial, um, as can details about that car. Now, it was recovered later, wasn't it? What do we know about the vehicle? Yeah, the car's a grey Mercedes GLA, and it was recovered on the 31st of December 2019 in the E14 area of East London. Um, but we believe for several hours on the 29th, the car was parked in the Bronze Age Way area of Viva. And we're very keen to talk to anyone who may have information as to where that car was parked and its movements in between the incident happening and it being taken to East London. Yeah, it really could be the vital piece of the jigsaw. And there is a reward on offer if anyone does need that extra incentive to get in touch with anything they do know. Tell us about that. Yes, Rob, well, we've uh, released a reward of £10,000 uh, for any information that could lead to the arrest and conviction of those responsible for Mark's murder. Yeah, so we urge anyone to get in touch. Jason, thank you very much for joining us today. It truly is a cold-blooded murder, simply for the sake of a car. If you can help, the number to call is 08000 468 999, and it's free from landlines and mobile phones. Now, that line's going to be open until 12.30 p.m. today, but don't forget, you can also text us 24 hours a day on that number there, 63399. Text the word crime, leave a space, and then write your message. Text will be charged at your standard message rate. Or you could always send us an email. The address is there on the screen, CWL at bbc.co.uk. Lots more still to come this morning, including... <laughs> the cruel scam that costs victims millions every year. I was making transactions with the bank, and I was really under his thumb. 
And the more stressed out I got, the more I was getting terrific headaches, couldn't sleep. Caught on CCTV, can you name the cash machine distraction thieves who stole £300 from a pensioner? And the special constables helping boost the numbers of police on the beat during the pandemic. Their dedication to actually helping in a time of national crisis, I think, is priceless. And over the last couple of weeks, our reporter, John Paul Davis, has been out and about gathering stories from across the country. Let's find out what he's got in store for us today. Now, demand for dogs and puppies has soared during lockdown, which means there's a lot of new dog owners out there. If you are one of those, then you'll want to keep watching because later we're going to be finding out how dog handlers here at Derbyshire Police have been learning how to look after their dogs if they're injured in the line of duty. Dog first aid, eh? Looking forward to that, JP. Right, next, though, it's time for today's CCTV appeal. And officers in the West Midlands are hoping you can help identify two men after a robbery at a cash machine. Have a watch. One morning in May last year, and these two men, one in grey, the other in black, seemed to be hanging around while people used the cash machine. 15 minutes later, at just gone midday, an elderly man goes to take out some cash. All looks normal as he makes the withdrawal. But one of the men from earlier is still hanging around. The pensioner takes his money and leaves, but the man wearing grey goes after him. Police say he told the man he had left money at the machine. He goes back and uses the ATM to check his statement, but by now, the two men have moved in closer. One of them gestures to the cash machine. He appears to be telling the victim something. Then he takes the man's bank card out of the machine. The elderly man isn't happy with that and takes it back. But watch what happens next. In the commotion that follows, the man moves in front of the cash machine blocking the pensioner's view and then the second man moves in closer to the ATM. Then both men head off, leaving the pensioner confused. But even he didn't realise what had really happened. Let's take another look. Police say that while the pensioner's attention was elsewhere, one of the men requested a £300 cash withdrawal. He then took the card out of the machine to distract his victim. And police say this was the moment the money was taken. Looking closely, you can see this man putting something in his pocket. One final exchange and the two men leave. The pensioner didn't even realise that £300 had been taken from his account until later. It is such a nasty thing to happen. Well, as you can imagine, police are keen to speak to these two men. They say they spent 15 minutes trying to engage with various people who were using the ATMs before the robbery happened. Remember, this was an 83-year-old man who was left suffering from stress as a result of this ordeal. So do you recognise either of these men? One was described as an Asian male in his mid-20s and of slim build. He's around six foot one tall with short to medium black hair, short stubble beard and a moustache. He was wearing a grey jacket, light blue denim jeans and black trainers with a white stripe. The second man was also described as Asian and in his early to mid 20s. He was medium build and slightly shorter than the other man with short to medium black hair and a beard. He was wearing a black jumper with EA7 printed on it, dark blue jeans and black trainers. Now these images were captured on a security camera inside the bank. So do take a good look and if you can name them, please do give us a call or even send us a text using the details on screen. Michelle. Lockdowns over the past year have been linked to a worrying increase in reports of domestic abuse. But it's important to remember abuse isn't always physical. Coercive control, controlling a partner through emotional or financial means is also a very real and very serious form of abuse. It's now five years since coercive control became a criminal offence in its own right in England and Wales, something that was seen as a major step forward for the criminal justice system. Natalie Curtis is with me today. Good morning, Natalie. Thanks for joining me. Good so you're a survivor of coercive control, but you're also one of those who's had a successful prosecution since the law has, has changed. Firstly, Natalie, could you tell me a bit about what happened to you? 
Sure. I met my ex-perpetrator in 2012. Um, I fled with the clothes on my back in 2018. Um, he was sentenced to two years in prison um, and made subject to an indefinite restraining order um, for controlling and coercive behaviour. An awful thing for you to have to go through, Natalie. Why was it so important that coercive control was made a specific crime? It's so important because physical abuse is pretty obvious in the fact of broken bones, bruises, cuts, etc. But with regards to psychological, emotional and financial abuse, for, for example, um, it's an ongoing journey. It's really hard to pinpoint. It has a dev devastating impact. It had a devastating impact on myself. Um, and it's quite hard, it's quite subtle sometimes to actually pinpoint exactly what's going on. Yeah. But the sentencing allowed me to step back um, and reach out for specialists support through Women's Aid. So you're a survivor ambassador for Women's Aid. What would you like to see change next going forward? Absolutely. I'm a really proud survivor ambassador for Women's Aid and I would like to see training, specific training for front frontline officers, GPs, courts, etc. is vitally important. Picking up on that point of, of training, I'd like to introduce our next guest, Melanie Morgan. Good morning, Melanie. Um, you're also morning. a survivor of domestic abuse uh, and a former police officer. We were just touching on the point um, of training being so important within the police forces. Can you tell us a bit more about what you're heading up? Uh, yes, I'm heading up the programme DA Matters. Um, it's a programme of training and cultural change. And we're training um, police officers, frontline police officers, officers and staff to recognise coercive control and behaviour so that they can gather the evidence and then we can hold perpetrators to account. And importantly, as Natalie says, it, it gives space for safeguarding of victims and time to recover. And how's the training going? Really well. Um, we have trained uh, in over half the police services around the country and we've uh, seen a 41% increase in rest rate, in the arrest rate for coercive controlling behaviour. And really importantly, the officers themselves say they feel more confident uh, at recognising coercive controlling behaviour and understanding the dynamics yeah, of what they're seeing a, when they attend homes. That's a really key thing. Melanie, thank you so much for, for joining us. That is encouraging to hear, isn't it, Natalie? And just before we end, for anybody that's watching this morning and is experiencing abuse, what advice would you give them? To reach out, there's help and support available. You're not alone. Um, call 999 if you're in immediate danger. Um, reach out to any specialist domestic abuse service. There is also support and, and advice available for um, employers. So the Employers Initiative on Domestic Abuse is a great organisation to go for help and support. Natalie, it's such an important message. Thank you again. Yeah. Uh, and details of organisations offering information and support with domestic abuse are available at bbc.co.uk forward slash action line, or you can call for free at any time to hear recorded information on 0800 888 809. Raf. Next to a cruel scam where the fraudsters have the elderly and vulnerable in their sights. Last year in Britain, more than £10 million was lost by victims of a crime known as courier fraud. Courier fraud is where a victim is contacted by an offender. Usually it's uh, via phone call. The victim have then been asked to go to a, a bank, get some cash, and then the courier will come, they'll knock on the door, and then the money's then handed over to the courier. In Lancashire, DI Mark Riley heads up the Economic Crime Unit. They're very convincing. They say they're from a police force, and they'll also say that don't speak to anybody else about it, don't contact the bank, don't tell your family. They steer the victim away uh, from any assistance, really, and get the trust built up. Today, he's visiting a victim who was recently conned out of £60,000 by criminals claiming to be from the police. Hi there, it's Mark Riley from Lancashire Police. You're not just alone in this, it's not an isolated issue. We're calling her Mary to protect her identity. First thing on a Monday morning, I had a cord sounded extremely official. This is New Scotland Yard Serious Fraud Department. We have your debit card. Oh, right. 
the man claimed someone had been using her card illegally. I absolutely believed I really was talking to the New Scotland Yard. And then it was had I made the following payments. And it went on from there. He kept phoning for you know, very long phone calls on my mobile or the landline. So I was on edge all the time. And also, he was deliberately sort of building up a relationship, sort of chatting about family, and then it was Christmas coming up. So we, we got very sort of chatty and friendly. Under the guise of helping an investigation, the fraudsters persuaded her to hand over £5,000 in cash to a courier she believed was working for Scotland Yard. But it didn't end there, and they asked her to purchase £55,000 of gold, which they collected on Christmas Eve. Initially, I was made to take an oath that I wouldn't breathe a word even to my close family. I was supposedly been getting all this money back as soon as all the arrests had been made and the investigation was over. But they still weren't done. And next they persuaded Mary to withdraw even more money and buy a further £40,000 in gold. They even monitored her calls. I was making transactions with the bank, but he would be on the, the mobile phone listening in. It was like a surveillance going on. I was really under his thumb. And the more stressed out I got, the more I was getting, you know, terrific headaches, couldn't sleep. Under pressure, Mary confided in a friend who encouraged her to contact Mark and his team. They knew immediately she was being defrauded. The police and the banks would never ring up and ask for personal information, so no passwords, no account details, and certainly wouldn't ask for you to go to any financial institution or a bank and withdraw any cash as an exhibit. Police managed to step in and stop £40,000 from reaching the fraudsters. Now the criminals realised police were onto them, but Mary didn't know who to trust anymore. It took an awful lot of convincing for me to believe that the Lancashire police were genuine and the other ones weren't. Police are still investigating, but have one crucial piece of evidence. Mary was able to record one of the fraudsters on the phone. I was suspicious, so I, I set up my iPad to record. So the next time he phoned, I just switched on the recording. Hello? What is going on? Don't know, you tell me what is going on. I've been trying to get through to you yesterday. I've been getting non stop calls from all sorts of police officers trying to get through to me. What is going on? All oh, right, so the, what police are those then? Sorry? What police I'm are those? I'm calls from the Lancashire police trying to get through to me. Yeah, but well, you're supposed to be the police, aren't you? Exactly, so what, what's the problem? Obviously, I told you from the beginning what the situation is. Like I said to you, I have no issue speaking with them in my own time. I mean, I spoke to you yesterday, I left you, I told you to rest for a bit. I've come back and you're not answering your phone. Then I'm getting... Oh, dear, what a pity. For Mary, the fraudsters have taken more than just her money. Having discovered, you know, how much I've lost, well, it's just depression, I just feel so low and... Um, Lack of confidence and not sleeping, worrying, you know, not eating, etc. You know, so um, it really has just knocked me for six. The callous offenders with no morals. I mean, to target elderly, vulnerable victims. Realistically, they're just about bringing misery, and you know, losing a small amount of money or a large amount of money can be devastating to a victim. Well, as we saw in the film, Lancashire police are investigating, but let's have another listen to the person making that fraudulent call and see if anyone can put a name to the voice. Obviously, I told you from the beginning what the situation is. Like I said to you, I have no issue speaking with them in my own time. I mean, I spoke to you yesterday, I left you, I told you to rest for a bit. I've come back and you're not answering your phone. Then I'm getting... Oh, reports. dear, what a pity. It's just quite extraordinary when you hear it, isn't it? If you know who that might be, do pick up the phone and give us a call now. Frauds such as these are just so shocking, aren't they, Rob? 
It is, but it's not just the financial impact that's so devastating, it's the emotional impact as well, as we've heard there, how it can affect people and they just don't know who to trust. Mm. It's good that Action Fraud have some solid advice though for people if they are, you know, falling victim to these kind of scams. Yeah, you know definitely. So it's, it's pretty clear advice. Stop, challenge and protect are the three words. So first of all, stop. Don't rush into doing anything at all. Challenge what you're being asked to do. Contact your bank or the police by their own official websites, not by a number you may be given by a fraudster. And protect, protect yourself. We heard there on the film the police would never ask you to hand over cash, valuables, gold or anything else to help a supposed investigation. It just wouldn't happen at all. So we've got to look after everyone and keep themselves safe. That's it. Great advice. And if you think you've been a victim of fraud, you can report it to Action Fraud online or you can call them on 0300 123 2040. Next, to Derbyshire, where John Paul's been to meet the police dog handlers teaching canine life-saving skills. Now, police dogs are an invaluable part of police work, whether it's sniffing out illegal drugs, helping to find missing people, or helping to bring violent offenders in. They are key, as Axel here uh, knows all too well. He's with Simon, who's the operations trainer here in Derbyshire. Simon, just tell us a little bit about what happened to Axel. Yeah, so Axel was on duty in 2018 with his handler and they were trying to apprehend a suspect. The suspect was armed with a knife and Axel received three stab wounds. He made a full recovery though and is now living life in retirement. I wish I could get a little bit closer to Axel, but because of social distancing, uh, we can't. But Axel enjoying a, a well-earned retirement. Back to Simon uh, a little bit later on. Over here is uh, Gemma. Now, Gemma... Introduce us. Who's this? This is Casper, our CPR dog. OK, and look, Casper looks uh, as though he's uh, had a bit of a tough morning. So what would you do to uh, a dog like Casper in this situation? OK, so if you were to find your dog like this, the first thing you'd need to do is make sure that you're safe to approach. Mm. Um, check to see if the dog is responding to you, so you'd shout its name and um, give it a little pinch on the skin. Look for any obvious big bleeds, catastrophic hemorrhage, and then we'd open the dog's airway because the tongue might be blocking their airway. So we extend that neck, pull the tongue out and forward because they've got big old tongues. Yeah. Um, and then we would check to see if the dog was breathing just like we would with a human, looking, listening and feeling for no more than 10 seconds. And also then checking for a pulse, the femoral pulse, reaching around just on the inside of the leg. If the dog isn't breathing and there is no pulse, we would start CPR on the dog. So, hand in the centre of the chest, indicated by where the elbow comes back and touches the chest. The other hand on top, and we do 30 compressions at a rate of 100 to 120 minutes. So, that's to the song beat Staying Alive. Yeah, it's got a nice beat. Just tell me, what situation might lead to Casper being, being this, this unwell? Maybe choking on um, some food or a toy or entering water and maybe drowning. Yeah. Um, so, after we've done those 30 compressions, we'd reopen that airway. And with the dog, we give mouth to snout breaths yeah. rather than mouth to mouth. Yeah. Uh, so, we'd seal that mouth up and two breaths, just enough air to see that chest rise. And then continue with 30 compressions and two breaths. Gemma, thanks so much for your time today. Let's find out a little bit more about what is in that first aid kit then uh, back here with Simon. Just, if you would, Simon, pick out a, a couple of key items for us. Sure, yeah. So what we've got then is equipment which is going to be saving the dog's life, yeah. um, chest seal, dressing for bleeds and tourniquets as well, which we'll deal with bleeds. Yeah, I recognise the tourniquets. You've got two of them there, so, so what's the difference? Yeah, basically, this is a human-grade one, which yeah. has this rod on it. This rod uh, is essential to tighten the pressure up. The problem with... Stop the... bleeding. Sure, yeah. yeah. The problem with this on the dog is that the dog's uh, shape, anatomy, is more triangular, so when you tighten that up, it tends to slip and not apply the correct pressure. OK. So we have a specialist tourniquet, which doesn't have the stick, it applies pressure by being bound around the dog's limb. Well, just show us, and, and, and as you do, just tell us how important these skills are, not just for working dogs, but for domestic dog owners as well. Yeah, definitely. The, you know, the kind of conditions we cover, they aren't just to do with, you know, police dogs. It's to do with, uh, you know, average pet owners as well, taking your dog for a walk and it yeah. jumps over a fence. It could take this, receive the same kind of bleed. Yeah, so I noticed you clipped it in there. Yeah, so you clip it in and basically from that moment on, we're pulling and applying pressure. As tight as possible. That's right. And just notice there's a grey marker on the, uh, the the last stretchy bit of the tool. OK, what, what's that for? That's to note the time down. So when the dog goes into further care from the vet, then the vet knows what time the, uh, the uh, 
tourniquet was applied. So they can then treat them further. That's right. Okay. So it's not left on there too long. Yeah, okay. Simon, thanks so much for that demonstration you. and for your time today. Look, it really makes you aware that these dogs are in really good hands when they're out on patrol. And I think the whole area of canine first aid, that might catch on, you know. Yeah, thanks, JP. Next, police need your help to catch a man who they believe has been committing indecent offences on the train networks in the southeast of England for more than four years. PC Olivia Hill from British Transport Police joins me now. Olivia, tell us more about these offences. Um, as you say, we're dealing with a series of uh, public decency offences which have taken place over the last four and a half years, which we believe to be linked. So far, nine separate women have reported crimes to us each with the same MO and with the same suspect description, which is an Asian male in his late 30s to early 40s with longish black hair and of a chubby build. And in each case, the male sits near to a female traveller and touches himself explicitly. And this is all whilst in full view of them. It must have been so intimidating for, the, for those women. Now, you have actually got a map that you've put together. It outlines the routes where these incidents happen. Talk us through this. Um, so the first incident that was reported was on the 13th of August 2016 and that was on a Thameslink service from Farringdon in London to East Croydon. But since then we've seen him offend from Redhill to London Bridge and from Brighton to Blackfriars. And the offences happen at different times of the day, don't they? They do. We've seen offences between midday to late in the evening. And spates between 2016 and 2017? Yeah, and interestingly, there was then a gap of about two and a half years before he began reoffending in 2019. Um, but worryingly, we've had four reports since uh, October. Really worrying. Now, we have actually got some CCTV. We can have a look at that now of one of the incidents. The behaviour here is really unusual, isn't it, Olivia? It is. This is the 2253 at Tombridge to Seven Oak service on the 6th. 6th of December uh, last year um, and we can see him get changed. He gets changed into a white top um, and blue shorts. Yeah, he had dark bottoms on at the start. Now he's changed into a white um, T-shirt. He moves through the train, doesn't he, before taking a seat next to the victim? He does. Um, he then commits the offence and walks off. Um, a witness to the incident actually then followed him down the train. Um, we'll try to find him afterwards. Mm. But as we can see here, he gets changed again, which means that the witness wasn't able to identify him. And this is actually a pattern that we've seen in the CCTV of all the offences. Yeah, really sneaky. You also have images of what you believe to be the same person from a number of the different incidents. Yep, um, same MO and same suspect description. Now, on the most recent occasion, he was very nearly caught, wasn't he? He was. This is the 30th of January this year. Um, it was on the 2029 from Red Hill to London Bridge. Um, and an off-duty officer sat near to the offender while he did the um, explicit act. She actually then followed him and tried to make an arrest, but unfortunately he jumped off the train at Coulston South. He jumped over the barriers, um, ran into a nearby housing estate and was able to get away. Um, so we still haven't been able to find him. Well, we really want to catch this person, don't we, Oliver? Thank you very much. Take a look at the images again, including this one from an earlier incident in 2016, the one without the mask. It's very clear. If you can help, please do pick up the phone. Now time for a look at the first wanted faces of this series. First up is this man, this is Liam Plant. He's wanted for an assault in Great Yarmouth in April 2018 in which the victim suffered a fractured skull. He has a scar on his right knee and he could be working in the construction industry. Or do you recognise this man? This is Gregors Kapuk, but police think he could also be using the stolen identity of a man called Jacek Boriez. After fleeing a Polish prison in 2014, he's now wanted by British police in connection with sex trafficking, prostitution and fraud. He's also wanted for failing to appear at court on a burglary charge earlier this year. It's thought he could currently be in East or South West London. Or perhaps you know 21-year-old Kamil Musil. Detectives want to speak to him about an incident in the Keithley area of Bradford last October where damage was caused to a property with a pistol. He speaks with a Polish accent and has connections to the Hare Hills area of Leeds, London, Southampton and across Scotland.
And lastly, this morning, this here is Marcus Hughes. The 39-year-old was sent to prison 12 years ago after robbing a shopkeeper at gunpoint. He was released on license in 2019, but failed to check in with probation and following another robbery is now wanted back in prison. He has two names tattooed on his chest and a scar on his left wrist. He has ties across the West Midlands, including Solihull, Birmingham and the Walsall area. Police say if you see him, don't approach him though. Just dial 999. So if you think you can help police find any of today's faces, do get in touch using the details on your screens. Next to the amazing volunteers helping keep our streets safe during these challenging times. I'm Tara. I've been a special constable for just over five years now. I'm only 24 and I'm currently the youngest female special sergeant in Avon and Somerset Constabulary. Tara is one of more than 300 voluntary police officers in the force who help boost police numbers. Each one does a minimum of 16 hours a month in the role, with the majority doing it on top of a full-time job. In my day job, I work in mental health. It involves often dealing with people who might be quite aggressive or vulnerable, which is quite similar to my role as a police officer. Make sure you get him home safely, all right? Today, she's on shift with retired paramedic and acting special sergeant Martin Callow. They're responding to reports of lockdown breaches. We call ourselves the COVID car. Right in the very first lockdown, we were going to 15 to 20 COVID breaches per night. Just going up to addresses, knocking on the door and finding out who's in the house. Nothing. No. For Tara, COVID has presented new challenges. I think we're all quite aware that we're putting ourselves at a greater risk being out on the front line all the time. But as long as we're taking the, the right precautions. COVID has really changed things for me as a police officer. Sometimes you want to be able to give people reassurance, which is quite difficult when you're two metres away. You have to conduct yourself quite differently. Avon and Somerset Police Specials dedicated around 73,000 hours to the role last year. For acting Special Sergeant Joel Bowd, the pandemic meant he was able to volunteer full time after being unable to work as an air steward on a private airline. I became a Special Constable in November 2017, so just over three years now. I've always had an absolutely huge interest in the police. I admire what they do on a day-to-day -day basis. Tonight, he's on duty with PC Connor Trotman on the streets of Western Supermare. Many of the skills he uses in his day job can be brought to bear here. When I was with EasyJet, you deal with multiple passengers a day. When you're flying at 38,000 feet and you have some troublemakers or people who have consumed a little bit too much alcohol, you'd often find yourself stuck in the middle between passengers and trying to de-escalate situations. Right, so... um. It's still fairly quiet out and about, uh, which is good. So it gives us a chance now to kind of do a bit of foot patrol, um, stay visible in the community, see what people are up to. Over the last year, with air travel dramatically reduced, Joel has had more time than usual to dedicate to the constabulary. You need to make sure you um, kind of let your emotions out and talk to people as well. Definitely talk to people. You always worry as a special coming in for free and being assaulted. But not only being assaulted now, you're always cautious about catching coronavirus and putting myself at risk. Not only myself at risk, but my partner at risk. It was quite a hard decision to make coming in sometimes. My family, certainly my mother, she knows what goes on out in the world, but they know I'll keep myself safe and I don't tell them too much. <laughs> With the police more stretched than ever, special constables have an even more crucial role to play. Some, like Special Sergeant Chris Rees, 
have undergone additional training, allowing them to drive on blue lights to emergency calls. I've been a special constable for 12 years, currently hold the rank of special sergeant at Wellington Police Station in Somerset. My normal day job is that I'm a nuclear safety case engineer in a nuclear power station. Primarily my day job is looking at risk, that's nuclear risk, but it applies the same to policing. It's not that normal for specials to go on this course, however, the force has recognised that the additional skills can benefit them and benefit the officers. Tonight, he's putting those skills to the test as part of a response unit with Acting Special Inspector Lee Gadd. And it's not long before they spot a motorist driving erratically. Anything alcoholic at all today? No. No? Do you smoke any cannabis or anything like that? No. Just look at me, just show me your eyes. I certainly find it's completely different to my day job, and it is an escape from my day job. And when I speak to my colleagues in work, I think they think I'm at sort of football matches, just policing the crowd, whereas in reality, we're supporting our regular colleagues right on the front line. Based on your behaviour, the speed as well, all right? The smell from your vehicle is consistent with cannabis, OK? So under Section 23, Misuse of Drugs Act, we're going to be searching the vehicle and yourself. In Avon and Somerset, we look the same, we wear the same uniform, we have the same powers, you wouldn't notice the difference. I've got a bud of cannabis under the driver's seat. Having the full powers of a police officer is a strange experience the first time you ever use it. You're under arrest and suspicion of driving a motor vehicle. Having that power of arrest to effectively detain someone, take away their freedom potentially and bring them into custody. The role of specials has been extremely tough during the past year but there's no doubting the commitment or the contribution of those who volunteer. Specials are invaluable. The experiences they bring to the role and their dedication to actually helping in a time of national crisis, I think is priceless. We could come in and boost the numbers of officers who were self-isolating at home. So that, that really did add value to the force. I can't imagine ever handing my warrant card back in and not stepping foot back into a police station again. It's just such a huge part of my life that I just don't imagine not doing this. Such a great job that they do, and all for free. Time now, though, for a look at what's been coming in on the phones, texts and emails. Some good calls already today, but police still need to hear from you if you have any information about the murder of 51-year-old Mark Allen, who you'll remember was run over by his own stolen Mercedes. And there's also just time to update you on one of last year's cases. Last March, we asked for your help after a young woman was assaulted in a bar in Selby and left with these really nasty injuries. Now, this man was caught on CCTV at the time, and as a direct result of that appeal, police were able to identify him as 22-year-old Mitchell Barton, a professional heavyweight boxer. He pleaded guilty at York Crown Court to inflicting grievous bodily harm and was sentenced to 13 months imprisonment. Yeah, great work, and it really does show the difference that your calls can make. Yeah, it certainly does. And that's all there's time for today. Tomorrow, we'll be out with officers on the streets of the West Midlands taking down car thieves. Advanced tea pack. <laughs> Make sure you tune in, it's not to be missed, that one. Dramatic stuff. For more details about the crimes on today's programme, please do head over to our website. Finally, we'll leave you with another look at this morning's Wanted Faces. If any of them look familiar, pick up the phone and tell us where they are. We're going to be back tomorrow morning at 11am. Until then, do take care. Bye-bye.